Welcome back to UVA Data Points. I'm Gia Smith. In today's episode, we're featuring a panel discussion from the recent UVA Miller Center event, U.S.-China Tech Competition. Has democracy met its match? This panel, entitled Apps, Platforms, and Surveillance, was moderated by Professor Ann Kokas, who was featured in the previous episode of UVA Data Points. Professor Kokas leads a discussion between John Chen, Kara Frederick, and Shanti Kalafil. During the panel, they address the long-term stability of U.S. technology infrastructure and related concerns for U.S. national security. The panel is introduced by William J. Anthalis, the director and CEO of the Miller Center. So he is the first person you'll hear. And from there, it leads into the panel discussion moderated by Professor Kokas. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all and welcome uh, to the Miller Center's 2023 William and Carol Stevenson Conference. We hold this event every other year, focusing on the most important national and international issues of our time. And a huge thanks to the Stevenson family for endowing it and for the support they've shown to the Miller Center over the years. 11 years ago, my wife and two daughters and I arrived in Beijing for three months of research. Before leaving, Brookings had equipped me with a brand new laptop and cell phone, burners as they're known, and many of you who've traveled have had them. At the time, Brookings was deeply concerned about a hack of our computer system where much of our data had been exfiltrated by a foreign agent. Shortly after we arrived, we moved into our Beijing apartment and a technician from the apartment complex knocked on our door to fix a mirror in our bathroom that didn't appear to be broken. <laughs> he would return every few days to keep fixing the mirror. Uh, not feeling that we had anything to hide, my wife and daughters and I enjoyed laughing and speculating. Our daughters were 10 and 8 at the time, speculating about what this technician was up to. But I did start to wonder from time to time, should I say or write all of my reactions to the particular meetings that I was having? If I was interviewing a person, would I be putting them at risk? Was I putting my Chinese national assistant at risk who came to the apartment on a regular basis? So 11 years later, all four of us carry one of these. It has a camera and a microphone and apps that may be recording anything and everything that we do and say and sharing it with US technology giants, as well as perhaps with Chinese authorities. So when Ann Kokus proposed the Stevenson Conference and that it be on the US-China technology competition, Following up on her own great scholarship in this regard, it seemed important, exciting, and prescient. Uh, Anne is the C.K. Yen Professor here at the Miller Center and Director of the University of Virginia's East Asia Center and also an Associate Professor of Media Studies at UVA. She's also a Fellow in the Public Intellectuals Program at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. What I had not realized that would, she would not only plan this agenda so well, that she would time it perfectly to be the day after Secretary Yellen gave a major, uh, Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen gave a major speech on US-China competition. <laughs> Yesterday, Secretary Yellen started with the monumental challenges facing the world. Recovery from a pandemic, the biggest European land war since World War II, potential military conflicts in Asia, and economic stress at home and abroad. And she said yesterday, progress on these issues requires constructive engagement between the world's two largest economies, yet our relationship clearly is at a tense moment. It's quite an understatement. With a major war in Europe and fears of one in Asia rising, it was little surprise that national security topped the list. How does China's military use technology? What technologies might it be supplying to Russia in their No Limits partnership that would aid Russia's horrendous invasion of Ukraine. These are major security challenges. Secretary Yellen also warned against an overreaction. Unlike the first Cold War, levels of trade and integration between the United States and China are exceptionally deep and strong still. China is the US, is the US's third largest uh, trading partner. And China's extraordinary quarter century of economic growth has been fueled by that integration. And as Secretary Yellen said, decoupling would be disastrous for both countries and for the world. Moreover, it might make China more likely to do something dangerous militarily in East Asia. I suspect others today will want to talk about Secretary Yellen's speech. Is it possible to establish an equilibrium 
that would include fair rules of the road for competition? Is it possible to work on common challenges, such as the big debt issues faced by many developing countries and the fight against climate change? Beyond that, at the center of these questions is a topic that Ann Kokus has built this conference around, democracy. This competition was taking place at a time when our own democracy faces enormous pressures to sustain itself. The way that US-China competition and cooperation, particularly in technology, will shape democracy here at home is essential to this conversation as well. In other words, has democracy met its match? Is China's growing economic power combined with technologies we've helped them develop, creating an alternative model to liberal democracies around the world? Are liberal democracies committed enough internally and amongst themselves to maintaining core principles of intellectual property, freedom of expression, protection of individual privacy, and human rights. Indeed, are the US and other corporations from the leading, are, are, are leading corporations from the, the US and other leading democracies themselves chipping it away at essential elements of our democracy? These questions will be woven through our three panels today. The first focuses on apps, platforms, and surveillance. The second highlights China's role in the global business and financial sectors. And the third hones in on how US competition may play out with respect to new climate technologies at a time when the US has just made its greatest investment ever in clean energy technology. Our first panel is informed by pressing current events. States across the country have, become, have begun restricting the use of TikTok and other Chinese apps due to fears regarding data privacy, with Montana banning the app entirely last week. Federal regulators have cracked down on Tic Tac's parent company, ByteDance, to give up control of US operations or sell the platform completely, especially in light of the recent national security document leaks and the Chinese spy balloons. It is important to examine how social media intersects with national security and democracy interests with regards to China. Fortunately, we have three excellent panelists with us today to discuss these issues. Josh Chin is Deputy China Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. Josh. Um, and the co-author of Surveillance State, Inside China's Quest to Launch a New Era of Social Control. He previously won the Gerald Loeb Award for International Reporting for a series expo exposing China's government's pioneering experiments with digital surveillance. Kara Frederick, behind me, um, is the director of the Tech Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation. Before that, she worked as a fellow at the Center for New American Security and led Facebook's Global Security Counterterrorism Analysis Program. More importantly than her impressive career, Kara graduated from UVA in 2007, so Wah -wah. it's always <laughs> to have, great to have a Wahoo back home. I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, Shanti Kalatil is founder and principal at MDO Advisors with an expertise in national security issues in the information age. She previously served as deputy assistant to the president and coordinator for democracy and human rights at the National Security Council. She was also previously the senior director for the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. And this conversation will be moderated by Ann Kokus. So without further ado, Ann, over to you. Thank you so much, Bill. And I'd like to thank our three esteemed panelists from whom I have learned so much over the years in studying this area. So it's, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here with you. I'd also like to welcome our in-person and online guests to the Miller Center and give a special welcome to my students in the University of Virginia Engagements course, The Data Ethics of TikTok, many of whom are coming to the Miller Center for the first time. Uh, so just to begin, in yesterday's speech on the economic relationship with China at Johns Hopkins University, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen argued that the US, quote unquote, will assert ourselves when our vital interests are at stake, but we do not seek to, quote unquote, decouple from our interests, from our economy from China's. What are the key areas that you observe in your work where this tension between vital interests and economic engagement are the most delicate in the tech sector? Secretary Yellen, for example, highlighted China's export of surveillance equipment, as well as forced technology transfer from foreign to domestic firms. And I was wondering if there were other areas that you might highlight or other areas where you see this issue as particularly in tension. Shanti, do you want to start? Um, sure. 
Well, first of all, thank you so much, Anne, and thank you so much to the Miller Center for hosting this wonderful event. Um, I have also learned a tremendous amount from the panelists here, from the books that you've put out. I highly recommend them. Um, and actually, some of the points that you've made in your publications uh, have really informed my thinking on these issues. So to the point about balancing these issues, I mean, I think that's always been present in, um, in US foreign policy. But of, of course, it's come to a particular focal point now. Um, I actually have been thinking about a term that more accurately, in my view, represents some of uh, the dynamics involved. Because I think when we talk about decoupling, it sounds almost unrealistic in an age where our economies are so deeply entwined and intermeshed. You know, the Europeans have been using a term de-risking, and when I think about the types of concerns broadly that we are going to be talking about today, I do think about risk, for instance, risk to national security, risk to democracy and human rights, um, risk to personal security, a lot of different ways that you can quantify that risk. And so in thinking about the types of risks involved, I, I just wanted to make a, a few points about uh, some of the topics of this panel and relate it to something that Bill mentioned at the beginning, which is about democracy. And so the first, the first point is that, um, you know, I think for many years we saw technology as a tool that could either amplify or consolidate democracy or perhaps pose dangers through its usage. Increasingly, I have come to believe that technology is actually the site where the future of democracy and rights is going to be determined, mm -hmm. that they're actually inextricable now. And actually, some of the stories that Josh has mentioned in, in his recent book drive that home really well. You know, you, you have an anecdote about uh, a Uyghur family and their experiences in China. Um, we're really trying to untangle those issues is, is impossible. Um, so that's kind of the first point, which is that I think we need to stop seeing those, those issues in isolation. We have to accept that if we are talking about democratic processes, we must think about technology. Um, the second is actually something that you brought up in your own book, Anne, which is about the different ways in which data can be trafficked around the world, and you particularly focus on China. Um, I think that uh, obviously we will probably talk about TikTok today. This is you know, a big issue. But I would really encourage folks to widen that aperture a little bit and think about the many other ways in which data can be exfiltrated and trafficked and used in different ways, um, especially in ways that I think are uh, detrimental to democracy and human rights. Um, and there are, well, we can get into more detail later, but uh, you have mentioned in your own work issues around the health sector, around gaming, around um, phenomena like smart cities, where I think some of the um, some of the nuances around data and the ways it can be used have been lost when we talk about these issues. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say very briefly is I would love it if we could then extrapolate from our knowledge of what we know now to the near future. And as we all know, we've seen tremendous advances in artificial intelligence just within the last few months, which I think are going to be something of a game changer when we talk about uh, the ways in which we interact with information, the ways in which we interact with data. Um, I think we have not been creative enough in thinking about the different ways in which um, for example, generative um, AI or um, different kinds of you know, virtual or augmented reality, the kinds of things that we see coming just over the horizon could be used in any number of ways that I think will be equally, if not more worrisome than some of the things we're talking about today. Thank you. Josh? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's a tough act to follow, Shazi. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, basically, what she what she said. Um, uh, I mean, maybe I can maybe I can advance this a little bit by just getting a little bit more specific. I think it's you know, it's really fascinating um, to think about decoupling and the tensions uh, involved in that, or or de-risking, as it were, uh, for the U.S. and the areas that I cover, um, which you know, is surveillance and AI. Um, you know, that is actually one area where the U.S. has actually has really made a, a pretty clear decision, particularly when it comes to chips. Mm. Um, and the US dominant, dominance of the semiconductor industry. You know, I was actually quite surprised um, at how decisive the US mm. was on this. When I first started covering this, this field, it just seemed that uh, there was nothing anyone could do because you know, huge American tech companies had a major interest in selling chips to China. They have massive business. You have, Intel is the obvious one. There's another one named NVIDIA. It's based in California that makes uh, 
what are called graph graphics processing units, which were originally developed for video games, but turn out to be really, really good for AI and are now the gold standard for AI. And in fact, there's an entire NVIDIA ecosystem that, that most companies that do serious AI work kind of have to use um, if they want to be cutting edge. Uh, and they, they were doing huge amounts of business in China. Uh, and it always felt like there was no way for the US government, for, you know, whatever its concerns were about the US providing these technologies to Chinese surveillance firms or to the Chinese military, that there was no way they were gonna overcome the uh, objections of industry uh, against cutting that off, and they did. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting, I mean, it was a very interesting choice that they made, um, and they've continued to put pressure um, and, and, and on companies and cut off Chinese access to that technology. Um, there are loopholes. China's figured out ways um, to get around that, but, but they have, it has really affected China's ability to do that sort of work. Um, so I think that's interesting in, the, in that sense that the, China, that the US really has made a decision, at least in that one core area. Um, but I mean, zooming out a little bit, I mean, she, she did mention exports of surveillance, and I think this is actually one of these areas that this is probably touches on what I think is the most interesting, or one of the most interesting tensions when you talk about the role that technology um, plays in the future of democracy. And I totally agree with, with, with Shanti. I, don't, I think they're indivisible now. They are basically, technology is where, this is where the future of democracy is going to play out. And you know, when I was working on my book, one of the places I went to um, when looking at China's exports of surveillance equipment was Uganda, mm. um, which is a really fascinating test case because it is a country that gets a huge amount of aid from the U.S. Um, uh, has and has and has been supported by the U.S. Um, and was held up at one point as a potential sort of democratic model for the future of, of sub-Saharan Africa. It, it since has become a much more authoritarian place. Um, China and, and has become a place where China and the U.S. are now wrestling for for influence, and the story that that I went there to report with with colleagues was in 2018 and 2019. Uh, Yori Museveni, the the leader of of Uganda, was facing a huge political challenge from a, from a sort of upstart young um, singer who who was, who was uh, had sort of rallied the youth uh, in opposition to him, and. He, his solution was to go to the Chinese embassy um, and, uh, and ask for help. And the Chinese embassy uh, worked with Huawei, which has a huge presence there. They, um, they took a bunch of uh, Ugandan police to, on a trip to China, took them to the Ministry of Public Security offices off of Tiananmen Square, showed them how it all worked, and, um, and then, and then basically sold Museveni a sort of uh, a starter kit, a state surveillance starter kit, um, which he then did use in the most recent election, I think probably to great effect. I mean, he did win it. Uh, there, there are people, there are people who, who doubt the results, but, but you know, he has basically used that system to really, to really neutralize a major threat to, to his power and sort of crush uh, democracy, at least for now, in Uganda. And I think you know what that story illustrated to me is the is the power of China's of China's appeal to countries that are sort of on the verge of on the on the sort of verge of, of kind of teetering one way towards either democracy or authoritarianism. It, China comes with these systems. I don't think it's trying to necessarily replicate the China model everywhere, but it is offering these systems and ideas about how to use these technologies to anyone who will buy them. And it basically is it's a sort of laissez-faire attitude. It says, you know, here you, here you go. You, we don't care how you use it. Just <laughs> you use it, and we'll we'll teach you if you if what if you what you want to do is is uh, is is repress your political enemies. We'll teach you how to do that, and uh, and that's enormously attractive to to a, to a large number of, of countries. And I think what the U.S. has not done, the U.S. Has talked about trying to restrict. I mean, they've obviously ran a campaign against Huawei that that has been very successful. Um, in terms of keeping Huawei's uh, 5G technology out of, out of allied countries. But the U.S. has not really developed an alternative model that can compete with China's. Yeah. They have, there's no vision, there's no democratic vision coming out of the U.S. about the uses of these technologies, how you can use them, how you can extract 
the positive uses of these technologies while mitigating against the, the negative ones. Um, and I think that's the real, that's one of the real challenges the U.S. faces right now. Well, okay. I'm a little insulted because I wrote a whole paper called Democracy by Design that attempted to have that <laughs> affirmative vision, and I, I guess Josh didn't read it, but you guys do. Um, so, no, I, I do think I can build upon um, what Shanti and, um, and Josh has, ha has said, so tell me in a few minutes if it works. It might not. But what I think in terms of the, the delicate um, things that we're not thinking about yeah. that, that are you know, integrated that we don't really know, I'm looking at the information environment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, uh, I used to work in the intelligence community for the United States and then uh, Facebook after that. And what, what stood out to me when I went to Silicon Valley from working in DC in the government was, you know, you had uh, people from the diaspora, you had uh, Chinese Americans, um, and even at the time, people on H-1B visas who were working as programmers at Facebook, um, we didn't necessarily have that geopolitical cognition, like, oh, there's a history of forced tech transfer, of, of IP theft, and you're just kind of, you know, working with uh, the, the guy with the visa next to you, and he <laughs> happens to be from China. but with Confucius Institutes and United Front work and, and everything like that, I think uh, what Jen Easterly had called, the, she caught a lot of flack for this, but the cognitive landscape I think is extremely important. So Josh talked a, a lot about you know, the, these surveillance packages and um, all of the, the hard cyber concerns, the data collection mechanisms, uh, Shanti alluded to that, that as well. But when you look at something like TikTok, again, Shanti mentioned it, um, I'll use TikTok as a synecdoche for, you know, sort of the next TikTok. Um, all of these digital platforms, which are, have, you know, maybe parent companies headquartered in Beijing, subject to the PRC's laws and policies. And, and I'll say that there is a way to manipulate the information environment through these digital platforms that, you know, we hadn't thought about for, for a long time. Um, you had great, um, reporting from Forbes uh, and, and BuzzFeed RIP, uh, some of those um, you know, journalists uh, have basically revealed that there are actual narrative pushes going on on these platforms. There are um, you know, censorship initiatives. Um, you know, people will say, OK, you can still access some of the uh, news about the atrocities uh, in Xinjiang. But we know, at least from course reporting in, by February 2019, a lot of this reporting was censored. Hong Kong protests, same thing. Thing, uh, mentions of Tiananmen Square or uh, Tibet, those kinds of things were censored. Um, and then there are, uh, you know, on the alternative angle, they're trying to push uh, CCP propaganda effectively. Top Buzz um, was laundering uh, a lot of those stories through, through that app. Um, again, Forbes and, and BuzzFeed reporting revealed some of that and whistleblowers as well when it comes to TikTok. Um, so, I think it's sort of important to, when you think about sort of the next generation of citizens, there's a lot of young people in this room right now, and we know that, that Google is running scared when it comes to how people get their news. Um, you know, American adults over, uh, in the last two years, the American adults who get their news from TikTok has tripled. So what does that mean for the information environment when, as Director Christopher Ray said, um, this algorithm actually is, uh, he said verbatim, controlled by China uh, and we know that um, uh, when you know Project Texas was sort of floated as the thing that will mollify a lot of the US national con security concerns uh, China uh, a few years ago even before Project Texas was just in its infancy they they basically said mm, we're not going to give up the algorithm and then they instituted some export controls which will likely cover the algorithm as well so when you know there's a commercial aspect to that but then there's also that information cognitive security uh, aspect Aspect too, if um, you know what is being pumped into the brains of our children, 67% of American teens are on TikTok as of last year, uh, matters too. So I think there's sort of a um, something that we don't think it's a little more squishy. But in terms of decoupling, do we want to um, cede the information environment totally to something that is CCP owned and control? I would say no. Okay, so. So Kara, actually, I was trying to start off with a soft, like non-TikTok, oh, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> but but you know, because once once it once we let it out of the once we let it out of the box, we Sorry. can't put it back in. No, but but this is but but I think this is really a question on on a lot of people's minds. There, you know, we had the recent congressional testimony, um, and this actually Kara's point brought up another question that I wanted to ask you, especially since we are at a university campus. Um, so when we see these when we see these discussions about data privacy and security in government, 
Um, by targeting an app that is uniquely popular. So Kara brought up the cognitive environment, the, you know, the experience of, of sharing information on, on social media apps and what that, might, what that might do in terms of how we understand our world. But um, by targeting an app that is uniquely popular with millennials and Gen Z, has the US government in some ways already failed to convince younger generations by presenting this as a conflict between youthful influencers and the political gerontocracy? Um, will young people simply dismiss well-placed concerns about uh, about surveillance and authoritarian linked platforms in the future because of these generational differences in our understanding and use of technology and I, I'd be really curious to see you know all, each of you have worked in this area in different in different ways and I'm, I'm curious about your perspectives on this so as Kara posed these risks how how does the you know the does the regulatory landscape in the US contend with these generational differences yeah and I think um, you know Chatham House rules and, and other conversations that I've had but um, I was I was talking with um, a handful of, of representatives of Congress members yesterday, and it appeared that um, you know they are they are very much aware of what you just identified. The mm -hmm. fact that oh no, like what what can we do when you have the Commerce Secretary? Everyone's probably familiar with the Restrict Act uh, right now, and that was sort of the Could bipartisan. You just give us a, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, um, <laughs> I I just drove in from D.C., so I'm D.C.-brained, <laughs> guys. So you'll have to you'll have to stop me, but um. The Restrict Act was uh, is uh, a, a piece of draft legislation. Um, it has uh, at least a dozen bipartisan uh, co-sponsors, and what it seeks to do is develop uh, a risk-based framework for contending with these digital platforms that emanate from our foreign adversaries. And um, you know, there's been I, I work at the Heritage Foundation, we're a conservative institution. There's been concerns on the right about the erosion of trust in institutions. Um, U.S. institutions, given surveillance mechanisms, sort of turn inward on our citizens. Uh, but on the left, you have the the Secretary of Commerce, which uh, this Restrict Act would, um, you know, give her authority to make these determinations about uh, the risks of these uh, foreign-owned platforms. Uh, you have the the Commerce Secretary effectively saying, if we ban TikTok, then I'm afraid we're going to lose every voter under the age of 35. So everyone is sort of aware uh, that that this is a problem um, in terms of TikTok having a target on its back when you know TikTok influencers are traipsing around the White House uh, when uh, there are discussions of potentially creating a, a, a press room for these uh, TikTok and social media influencers too so so I, I think it is a problem I think it is a problem that um, you know nobody likes to appear out of touch but there are very real concerns with these platforms and again not just TikTok but the next TikTok you have uh, lemonade which is a uh, I don't know I don't know if the kids in the room know what this is um, but it's basically as if um, other people have said, as if Instagram and Pinterest have a baby. Uh, another, um, it's headquartered in, or its parent company is headquartered in China as well. Uh, so sort of the same sort of data collection issues, um, 2017 national intelligence law issues uh, with these companies as well. Um, so I, I, I don't want to say the well has been poisoned by these tensions, um, but but it is troubling when the negotiation between you know convenience and privacy or fun and privacy is something that um, I, I do think the younger demographic has a different view of. Um, and really the only way to contend with that is to be as clear as possible, frankly, to the parents. Um, I'm, a, I'm a new mom. You might have seen my baby. My sister took her out in the back. Um, but I'm, I'm very worried about, um, you know, know the potential for building the the dossiers like we used to do in the intelligence community based off of integrating a lot of these data streams um, you know seemingly disparate data sets that uh, China can take its hacked materials from the OPM hack the Equifax hack the Anthem hack the Marriott hack um, and sort of integrate these um, these uh, data sets together uh, with artificial intelligence, whose special, which you know, the specialty of AI is it, it parses through large amounts of data and it pulls out insight. It is able to detect anomalies, identify patterns. Um, what does that look like uh, in a place when you're you're looking at dissidents? Then it helps identify people who are, um, you know, sort of the Uyghurs of the world. So I, I think that we need to appeal directly to um, parents for the next generation coming up. Uh, but it is going to be an uphill battle given the fact that um, this platform's embedded in America now. Yeah. 
So I want to, so Josh actually had brought up a really interesting TikTok related point, and I want to make sure to give you a chance to, to address this as the, as the journalist in, in the room. Um, <clears throat> so how might we contend with the privacy versus free speech aspects of the TikTok issue? More generally, how might we think about balancing privacy, free speech, and national security in the US-China tech trade? So you both are journalists and you've written about uh, state surveillance, so I, I can imagine your perspective on this is, is quite complex. Yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, to, to lay my cards out on the table, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I'm, as a journalist um, and a journalist working in China, I do have a, um, a sort of, uh, I get a little twitchy when, when uh, people start talking about banning uh, sources of information. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal has, we actually had um, a really, really successful Chinese language website um, uh, for years when I first joined. And it was it was actually quite amazing uh, to to see um, you know just as to be uh, to be writing for that or having my my stories translated for that website and be able to interact with Chinese people who could access it and just see you know my reporting not just be consumed by American readers but Chinese readers as well and and um, it it got banned uh, part. Um, actually, it was around, I think, the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen Square when we started digging up our old <laughs> stories from back then and publishing them on, on the blog that I ran and then translating them into Chinese. Um, the government didn't like that very much. Uh, so they banned the, the whole website, and it's still banned. And, and the website of the, the Chinese website of the New York Times and English websites of the New York Times, the Washington Post, everyone is, is banned now. Um, and, you know, and the Chinese argument is that, that our websites are agents of our... our, our are vectors for foreign influence, right? Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I obviously disagree with that. And um, and so I am, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit. I, th I feel like it's a difficult um, tension that we have to wrestle with when you think about, you know, if if you care about free speech, um, if, when you're when you're thinking about TikTok, um, and you know, I think, but I do think there's an opportunity here. Uh, in the U.S., and we talked, or I mentioned earlier that that um, that the U.S. hasn't really put forth a model on how to deal with surveillance and the collection of data and these sorts of technologies. And you know, one of the one of the most amazing things about the U.S. is that we do not have federal data privacy legislation, right? Um, <laughs> amazing, a general, uh, general and, and, and actually, I'm probably not the most qualified person to, to speak about this because I write about China, not the U.S. But it is remarkable. You know, when I was looking around. Um, writing about state surveillance, looking, you know, you know China has uh, actually quite robust uh, data privacy protections. They have a huge carve out for the government that is problematic, but um, <laughs> otherwise is quite, is, is quite strong. Obviously, Europe has, has very strong regulations, the UK. Um, the reason the US doesn't, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. Obviously, one of them is, um, is the influence of Silicon Valley, of tech giants. They have, a, you know, they have a huge interest in being able to access as much data as possible. Their, that, their, their entire business model is built on that, and they have lobbied quite hard against this bill. But it is interesting when you think about TikTok and you think about trying to con convince, persuade younger people uh, that you're not just taking away their favorite social media platform for no reason with a ban. You know, an alternative approach to this is to use TikTok as a way to help propel privacy legislation. If you care about data and you care about tech companies exploiting data, whether they're Chinese, American, Russian, or whatever, you know, privacy legislation would go a long way, or at least as, as a first step um, to, to, to sort of mitigating that. Um, and it's, and that's, a, you know, that's something that is, you know, as, you know, if you apply it across the board, um, is consistent, right? And it's an argument you can make. And it was, you know, the, the CEO of TikTok when he was, test was testifying before Congress, he was making this point. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone was, or very few people were listening, but he kept saying, you know, nothing that we do um, in terms of data collection is different than anyone else in Silicon Valley. And there, there may be, you may be able to argue with that around the margins, <laughs> but, but, it's, but, it's, but, but the amount of data that, that Silicon Valley tech giants collect okay. is astonishing, yeah. right? And so it is, you know, what is, what is China doing with it or what is TikTok doing with it? That's a whole other question. But, but you know, I think the main issue is you're talking about how do you, rest, how do you restrict TikTok, if you're concerned about TikTok, from collecting that information in the first place. And I think, you know, actually having privacy legislation is probably, um, is, 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 is a solution that will, um, that will sort of get you out of having to face down your angry teenager. 
<laughs> right. I, I just make one point on that because yeah. I, I do agree with, and, and sorry for Shanti if you want to jump in, but I, I do agree with that aspect of Josh's argument wholeheartedly. Um, again, in my paper, uh, TikTok, a CCP official in every pocket um, out, out now, um, we talk about how there are you, there are ways for TikTok to get U.S. user data apart from banning the uh, digital platform from operating in the U.S. market. So that is a, a massive point. Americans should clearly understand how their data is stored, collected, and shared. And it, TikTok can get the data uh, because of these mechanisms, because of these SDKs, um, software development kits, and, and the way that data is shared and used, especially with third parties, too. So I think that is a fantastic point, and that would help sort of shore up these uh, security issues as well. Yeah. So, so come to the Miller Center. We can have bipartisan <laughs> agreement on important issues. Um, so, Shanti, uh, I wanted to. So, one of the things that we've discussed in our in our conversations is that <clears throat> it's not when we see TikTok. There are other Chinese tech platforms operating in the U.S. Um, how do these risks differ or not from U.S.-based apps? And and more importantly, do you think that current debates focus on the right risks, or are there other ways that you might reframe these issues? So for example, are there features of the, of the US political system that have led to focusing on specific single apps or specific companies rather than you know, these kind of larger data privacy issues? And as someone who, you know, who worked in the administration, how, how, did, how did you and your team, to the degree that you can share, kind of balance these challenges of actually being, being able to like move something forward versus kind of coming up with these larger, larger conceptual questions? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big question. And, you know, the way that I, I, first of all, I think that was a great discussion that we just had. And I agree that um, it, it is hard to walk things back and to try to introduce new attitudes towards privacy, yeah. for instance. And to get to your question, I do think it goes beyond just whatever app we're obsessed about at the moment. You know, Kara, you brought up Lemonade, um, which is, uh, I understand, you know, becoming more popular. It's based on a Chinese app, uh, Xiao Hongshu and, and Little Red Book. And it's, are we just going to keep trying to ban all the apps? While at the same time, there are so many other places that just as important data, perhaps more important data can be gathered. In your own book, and again, you talk about the health sector and the ways in which so many kinds of health data is now collected by apps that's not protected by HIPAA. Yeah. And I think very few people are aware of that. When you get on an app and you say, well, I'm going to track my um, sleep or my breathing or whatever, <laughs> you're giving up so many pieces of your biometric information yeah. without even realizing it. Um, and it's one of those ways in which I don't know if comprehensive privacy data um, protections would, would completely help, but certainly it's a layer that we would absolutely need to have to start getting at some of these wider issues. Um, another, I'm not kidding when I said I really have been inspired by your books, both of you, but um, you, one chapter you have in your book, Anne, is on gaming. And you talk about TikTok being sensitive. You want to take games away from the youth? I mean, <laughs> good luck. However, the fascinating thing that I think not many people are aware of is the Tencent, which is you know one of the big Chinese companies, and Josh, you may address this in your book as well, it is a huge player in the gaming industry, yet we, it is completely not being looked at. I think part of the reason is in our own policy debates in, these, in this country, it is hard for us to do more than one thing at once and to look at more than one thing at once, and so it's easier to kind of pick out one thing and then let's just go full bore on that. That's not to say there aren't legitimate concerns with TikTok for instance. But when you look at this broader landscape, um, you know, gaming, as you point out, also uh, is a site of tremendous uh, data generation, potential data trafficking, patterns of behavior, patterns of social networking, financial um, transactions. So many different things are bound up in, the, in that platform. So that's all to say, I think we need to be more aware of the various types of ways, as opposed to focusing on a single app or issue, let's look at the broader landscape and try to better educate ourselves about these issues. Um, and then just, you know, to talk about how to get at some of these issues, I will say, you know, when I was in government, obviously we couldn't look at the full, you know, my team was focused on a set yeah. of specific things. One thing that we tried to do um, through the Summit for Democracy, the first one, and which I understand, you know, I followed some of the outcomes of the second, is to use that as a way to advance some of the more proactive thinking about technology that you mentioned, Josh, and I think Carrie referred to as some of, you know, how do we actually both 
try to clamp down on the bad stuff and then push forward some of, like, make sure that we're showing up in ways that show that um, technology can actually enhance democracy as opposed to, you know, be used as a tool to restrict human rights. Um, one initiative, again, this is something that I'm a private citizen now, yeah. so I was just watching this latest summit and some of the things that came out of it. Um, but there is a, a, an initiative to try to um, work on curbing the export of um, spyware, commercial spyware, which I think is really important, especially if you track the ways in which authoritarian regimes clamp down and actually use commercial spyware to repress dissidents um, around the world. So that's uh, in instances of transnational repression, um, where, for instance, you know, Uyghurs that may have fled to other places would still be tracked by the Chinese government because you know they could be subject to this kind of spyware. So one of the ways where I think trying to make um, different pieces of this puzzle work, at least focusing on a couple of these discrete initiatives, I think can help make a difference. And particularly when it comes to uh, really important issues like transnational repression, you know, this commercial spyware piece could actually be quite significant. Thank you. Josh or Kara, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think um, as all those points are, are impressive and, and right. Um, the, I, especially with when you look at sort of sensitive, personally identifiable information, alluding to, to healthcare and whatnot, um, you know, why not enshrine biometric data as sensitive data uh, with a proper NIST framework and standards? Um, so I think that is just low hanging fruit that we haven't gotten around to that can be integrated into a national data privacy protection framework um, that would, I think, go a long way, as you said, in sort of layer those protections for the American people. So, so yeah, there are simple, um, even technical fixes for, for this kind of thing. Um, and the last sort of technical fix that I'll um, talk about is I'm, I think privacy preserving technologies, you know, whoever finds the, the privacy solution is uh, not only going to be very rich, but going to do a big service for democracy, I think, um, uh, across the globe. So the United States has the opportunity to really dictate the design of these products that are imbued with privacy protections. I mean, in the design phase, we talk about privacy by design a lot. And instead of having to go back and say, retrofit these privacy protections, like we're trying to do now, try to, uh, if uh, programmers, if commercial entities, um, maybe even nudged by the government, by Congress, representatives of the people, People at this point are, are are pushed in the direction to imbuing those privacy protections in the design of a lot of these products that we then seed throughout the world uh, to our friends in, in Japan and India and whatnot. I think that could go a long way in sort of preserving the system that we want to see uh, reign vice the closed system that the CCP is propagating. So uh, thank you for, for those policy suggestions. and. Um, and for, for all of you, I, I'm actually very eager. We have a terrific audience today. Um, and the in-person audience has index cards on their seats. Attendees can submit those questions to Alfred Reeves, who is in the back. Uh, Alfred, do you want to raise your hand? To, okay, so you can submit your questions to Alfred Reeves. Um, attendees can also, the online audience can also use the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen to submit questions. So we are eager to hear audience questions, um, so I urge all of you to submit those questions uh, as you're preparing them, and, and then I'll, I'll go with one question just to make sure our audience can get prepped to ask those questions. So. Now, one final question for you guys as we're preparing for our audience questions. Thinking about the future, what is a serious long-term risk in the US-China tech trade, particularly surrounding apps and surveillance, that you think is widely overlooked? So Shanti, you mentioned healthcare um, and games. Uh, but I was wondering if there's anything that we haven't discussed that, from your perspective, is something that our audience really should know about and should pay attention to moving forward and looking to the future. And if you want to repeat a previous answer, just something to, because <laughs> you guys have been great, so. Okay, well, let me take a, yeah. um, a quick stab at that, I, and it kind of relates to what I mentioned in my initial comment, which is, I think now, more than ever, we have to be particularly attuned to the ways in which new advances in technology can be utilized, particularly by authoritarian competitors, mm -hmm. to try to target U.S. society or U.S. national security. Um, I. I can't articulate for you all the various usages, but for instance, several years ago, before when I was in um, 
uh, my job at the International Forum for Democratic Studies, you know, we talked to a number of forward leaning thinkers and uh, people who were studying kind of the future of disinformation. And I feel like just in that short span of time, since those few years, three or four years ago when we had those conversations till now, we're starting to see those things happen. And we weren't well prepared then, and we still are not well prepared. Recently, um, as you may have followed, you know, the Justice Department returned indictments on several um, uh, Chinese nationals who are associated with the Ministry of Public Security, I think several of which were accused of operating a troll farm, um, which mimicked these classic Kremlin techniques of trying to spread disinformation to divide, confuse the American public. Those are all kind of tried and tested techniques. It's interesting that now we see the PRC trying to go to that Kremlin playbook. Mm -hmm. But what's more worrying to me is the ways in which new um, you know, again, artificial intelligence and other ways to generate natural seeming content, images, um, imitating voices. You, I don't know if you're following this whole thing with, um, I think it's Drake in the weekend. I can't believe I'm trying to say this publicly without messing this up. That's just one example, right? I mean, they had this, this song come out that didn't yeah. come from them. Yeah. But imagine, just use your imagination to think about the ways in which these types of technologies could be used to generate very genuine seeming disinformation. And we don't have, to use a term that uses sort of the cognitive defenses in place to guard against that. So that's just kind of putting on sort of the, just a lens that's just a little bit out in the future, and I think we need to get much smarter about that. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, on one hand, this is, it's quite fascinating because we have to think about, it's, there's a little bit of a sci-fi aspect where we try to think about like what future technologies will be, to be developed and how will we adopt them and how will we use them. Um, but by the same token, needing to think about the, you know, the ways in which that impacts democracy and our systems of governance becomes also really important. Josh or Kara, is there anything you'd like to add there? Oh, I just, I just one, one minor add on to what Shanti said. I mean, I think, you know, the interesting thing about Chinese disinformation efforts and the, and the Department of Justice indictments um, and, and just all of the reporting about this uh, um, is, and I think about this a lot as a, as a reporter, because when you think about stories you're going to cover, you think about what is the impact of, of what is happening. And one of the, the really interesting things about disinformation, Chinese disinformation, is that it's actually not very good. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, it's, it's like, it's just, they don't get a lot of traction on Twitter. They don't, you know, they haven't really had nearly the impact that, that Russia uh, has, has had in various places. And, and, and I think part of that actually is because, or at least one theory I've, I've, I've come across that I think is, is compelling is that, you know, Russia has, uh, I mean, nominally has a democracy. Um, and, and so, you know, Russian operators are used to dealing with sort of democratic, discourse in some way, right, and, have, and having to be convincing and persuasive and, and like, whereas China, like, people in China are not, right? Like, the people who are sort of creating propaganda campaigns that they're trying to use to disrupt, uh, you know, American society or for whatever political purpose they may have, they just don't have that vocabulary. And where something like ChatGPT comes in is that it gives them a tool to be much more persuasive, right? Because now they have this ability right. to just put in a prompt, and that, and whatever that prompt spits up, is going to have access to all of the data that was fed into it, and all of that data comes from the U.S. And so I do think I think Shanti's really prescient in, in bringing that up, and that I do think that could be a, uh, that could really change the the landscape for for China in that sense. Yeah, and, and not only that, but and to be able to articulate in, in you know human like ways using natural language processing and whatnot um, to give them another arrow in their quiver. I mean then you can narrowly target and tailor these propaganda efforts too. So you layer you know, that onto uh, the fact that AI helps us make determinations based off of um, digital behavior. Uh, you can have a, a digital profile. Uh, Google was doing this a uh, long time ago uh, in 2016. They were categorizing users as right-leaning or left-leaning in order to enhance their um, ad targeting efforts. Um, so if a nation state is sort of able to do that with these new tools, it makes them scalable, it makes them efficient, and and it uh, increases the breadth of their reach too. So I think uh, I agree completely with this panel and think the only, the, those you know information, the information war is only going to be enhanced by these new technologies, particularly synthetic media and um, generative AI. Oof. 
Well, all right. <laughs> so a very, very optimistic, uh, like a very optimistic discuss discussion to start your Friday morning. But, um, but these are really important questions, and I think impact everyone in this room in really significant ways. Um, so one of the things we have a student question. Um, so even if TikTok and if, even if TikTok is banned and Lemonade and other Chinese apps are banned, um, can't the Chinese government just obtain U.S. data by buying it through data brokers? The officials worried about TikTok don't seem very worried about U.S. companies profiting off of our personal data. So how do we contend with that? I think the, the National Data Protection yeah. Framework, and within that framework, you have to be able to, dare I say as a conservative, regulate uh, <laughs> the uh, third party access to this data and how data is shared, especially with those third parties. Um, as I said before, and uh, the kids in the room will know, Gizmodo does a lot of actually really good reporting on the fact that mm -hmm. user US user data can be obtained by TikTok, even if TikTok is banned. Therefore, you need to have that backstop, and that backstop is that National Data Protection Framework um, you know, nobody more than me is very concerned about how these commercial companies use and manipulate our data. Um, saw these kinds of things third hand. Uh, we're seeing the vestiges, uh, or first hand, and we're seeing the vestiges of, you know, what, um, you know, it's doing to our society and the, the minds of our children, really, um, in, in the U.S. body politic alone. So um, there are a lot of legislative proposals on the horizon. Uh, primarily, I think Senator Lee has an ad tech bill uh, that they plan to reintroduce shortly that, that basically clamps down on uh, some of the, the data grabbing that these companies are doing. And I think all of the, these things together are, are really good starts to uh, enshrining American data with the protections that it deserves. Thank you. Uh, so this is a question from Professor Lund Chopa from the Politics Department. Um, is there a place for reciprocity in US, te US tech policy vis-a-vis -vis China? So is there is there a possibility that, you know, that the U.S. could allow companies like TikTok to operate if companies like Facebook or the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> no, okay. Yeah. So, so John, you <laughs> all right. So this is like quite. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, you know, reciprocity is, yeah. I think, a really fascinating question, especially yeah. when it comes to free speech issues and, and right. sort of okay. values-related yeah. industries, right? Um, and this particularly with 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 news. Um, and we've had this. You know, there's a debate um, that. That the you know a bunch of U.S. news organizations, including my own, had uh, most of their American correspondents expelled from China, including me, um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, and there's and you know that was just the most sort of dramatic development in this very long-running debate about reciprocity in media, right? And and whether or not um, China was allowing enough foreign reporters into the country, allowing you know en enough freedom to report given the freedom that Chinese journalists enjoy in the US. Um, and it's a, it's a really difficult debate, right? Because you know you, you start talking about freedom of the press, that's a core American notion, right? And so do you, do you restrict Chinese journalists, the ability of Chinese journalists to work here? You know, I mean, I, these are not easy questions. Um, I, and you know, I do think it's, it's sort of a non-starter when, you, when you're talking about platforms, because China's just never going to ever, ever allow any American. I mean, they tried it with LinkedIn, and even yeah. that didn't work, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, I, I think that's just not going to happen. So I think reciprocity is one of those ideas that if you're, you know, if you think about it from the U.S. standpoint, it's, it's just kind of hard because it requires you to consider compromising on, on really core, core American ideas. If you, if you really want to punish China, uh, if you want to do an eye for an eye on information, China's going to win, mm. right? Because they, they, their entire system is built on limiting information, yeah. uh, whereas the US system is built on, on the opposite. So speaking of the U.S. system, another one of our great audience questions is why has there so been why has there been so little discussion about the fact? So this this person brings up that there are a lot of um, investors in ByteDance that are U.S. investment funds, but also I want to add to this and say the you know the economic benefits that U.S. companies are drawing from being able to access TikTok, um, the growing influencer industry. So why has the focus largely been on 
China's investment and China's involvement in propagating TikTok rather than on the investment and involvement of US investment firms and US uh, advertisers and US social media influencers. So can you, can you, ex can you expand a little bit more on that and maybe, maybe discuss what those, what those challenges are in terms of dealing with US economic investment engagement in, within TikTok? I think the reason why there's been so little conversation is because it impugns a lot of us. Um, mm. You know, it it uh, lays bare the fact that you know we have been um, some of us have been getting rich off of um, what China is doing. Uh, and the way that I would sort of explain, or I have explained uh, about the influencer issue is. You guys take one for the team. You know what I mean. There are other platforms. Uh, we we like healthy competition in the tech space, and there are other platforms to to use. Um, hopefully, there will be somebody who um, designs a, a better algorithm than the for you algorithm that um, uh, is more salubrious, shall we say, for the American youth. Um, there's a lot of problems with this one now in terms of surfacing content that's, you know, eating disorder, self-harm. Uh, a lot of enterprising journalists have uh, come to the determination that if you register on TikTok as a 13 to 14 year old, you're going to get served content and within minutes uh, that is very detrimental to your well-being and your health in general. Um, but putting that aside, I, I think influencers do at this point have a duty to to sort of, you know, move and migrate to, to other platforms. Um, and then I think that it, it, it's very, it, that gets at the, you know, the general bigger question of um, Chinese investment in America making GDP go up and, you know, what, what do we value? Do we value that pointy line going up or do we value uh, the, the mental health of our children or our national security or our vulnerabilities to some of these hard cyber risks? Um, so I think that's a trade-off that Americans have, you know, delayed making and they, they need to make. And a lot of these influencers, a lot of these people who are, you know, padding their pockets um, have to, frankly, take one for the team. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to add to that? Only to say that I think, you know, there is a long history of um, U.S. investment in the, the PRC surveillance state. Actually, Josh, you talk about that and you name some of the companies. And I, you know, that's something I think we've always grappled with. Yeah. And I think we need to be much more clear eyed about the ways in which U.S investment and support is has actually contributed to the development of some of these really troubling trends. So I hope there's more attention to that. Josh. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I, I, um, yeah, it is true. I mean, they've been, the um, American investors and, and tech companies have been involved in, uh, in Chinese surveillance from the very, very beginning in the late 1990s when the internet had sort of just arrived in China. So, um, so, so the U.S. has, has profited uh, handsomely is midwife this, the, the whole industry basically in China um, and uh, you know and I, and I think it's interesting because it was you know it's a mirror of the US relationship with China in general right is that um, for a long time particularly before China got into the WTO which is right around uh, when, when the surveillance industry started to to, to rise um, the, you know China had was granted most favored nation status every year and it was always there was always a debate about whether China's human rights record was was good enough to merit that and, and so there was human rights was an actual talk you know it was, was a real subject uh, in, in, U, in US China relations and then as soon as China joined the WTO that kind of went away right I mean people paid lip service to it uh, but the but the profits that, that American companies could make in China were just so enormous uh, that no one really talked about it and we're now in a really fascinating moment because in, human rights has re-entered the conversation in a real way um, and I think it's, you know, it's, I'm kind of surprised, maybe I'm cynical, but, um, but it is interesting, right? And so I think this is a moment where you, knew, you now actually have human rights being raised in boardrooms, in American, you know, in American corporate boardrooms uh, as a risk, um, which, which, is, which is, we've not seen for, for 20 years. Um, and so what, you know, what happens with that, it's hard to say, but it definitely is, a, I think it's a, it's a really interesting moment. And if you are, if you are interested in, in sort of trying to shine a spotlight on American business involvement in, these, in, in this industry, then this is a good moment for that. 
Well, uh, Kara, do you want to add? Well, I, and yeah. I was just thinking as Josh was talking, it's when you have, you know, Tim Cook, as reported by um, the information in 2016, signing a, a $275 billion with Apple to um, commit to its technical uh, prowess, then then I think you, you we need to scrutinize uh, joint ventures with these mm -hmm. companies, especially when uh, these ostensibly private companies in China have, have state links or they're working in direct service of uh, the technological development of the, the CC. So it's, um, I think people need to know that and not many people do. Well, on that note, hopefully all of you have learned some new things from our panel. I'm so grateful for the excellent comments of our panelists and their, their sharing their wisdom with us today. Um, I, let's give them a round of applause and thank you so much.